Hi, everybody. My name is David Ringer with the National Audubon Society, and I saw a bird today. I saw a Cooper's hawk, which is a bird that spreads out across most of the U.S. in the winter and sometimes visits our bird feeders. That's really cool. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Christine Lin, and I also saw a pretty common bird. I saw a great blue heron, which you can probably see across much of the country. I still remember the first one I ever saw, such a beautiful bird, even if they are common. Uh, that's great, Christine. Well, welcome to our episode tonight of I Saw a Bird. Um, we wanted to start off uh, thinking about where we are. So we started I Saw a Bird because of the isolation induced by the COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately, we're seeing a dramatic rise in cases, hospitalizations, and death all across the country. Um, and that's going to mean that a lot of our viewers are having to make hard choices to stay home and skip family events and other things during the holidays. Um, so first of all, we want to send our best to each of you and your families. We want to say wear a mask, be safe. Uh, if you're not sure about masks, we have some beautiful Audubon ones that may convince you. We'll drop a link in, um, but please be safe. Uh, so what we wanted to do tonight is focus on birds around your home and in your backyard. Uh, even if you live in an apartment, there'll be some things for you here tonight. Uh, we know that birds provide so much joy in your daily lives. And so we want to share that with you this evening and give you some practical tips. So our lineup for tonight's show uh, is that first we're going to be um, talking about the do's and don'ts of bird feeding. Some real practical tips for you here. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about ways that you can create habitat for birds in your yard um, and share some ways that you can make your home safe for birds no matter where you live. Um, and then we're going to end with a deep dive on, on a very important law called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, and actions you can take wherever you live to help protect that bedrock law for birds. Cool. So like what David mentioned, we're going to start off the show with the do's and don'ts of bird feeding. And we're excited to welcome onto the show, Melissa Grew and Jeff LeBaron. So Melissa Grew is a wildlife photographer, a writer and a conservationist with a passion for educating people about the natural world. And she also teaches online bird photography classes through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And Jeff LeBaron is the Audubon Christmas Bird Count Director, a title which he's honorably held since 1987. And as an integral member of the Audubon Science Division, Jeff also works on other community science projects, including Climate Watch, Hummingbirds at Home, and the Great Backyard Bird Count. So welcome to the show, Melissa and Jeff. It's great to be Thank here. You. Yeah, great to be here. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Well, since this is I Saw a Bird After All, we wanted to start by asking some of the favorite birds that you're seeing around your feeders. Melissa, let's start with you. So just so everybody knows, I live in upstate New York uh, near Ithaca, and I am super excited about what I'm seeing lately at my feeders because we're getting this sort of infusion of finches and different finch species from the far north this year. It's called an eruption. And it's when these birds come down from the boreal forests because there's a bit of a shortage of their favorite food, which is conifer seeds. And so we're really blessed and privileged to see them because they're going farther afield to forage for food. And so I have been really lucky to be visited by a kind of finch called an evening grosbeak. And I think we have a few photos maybe uh, of mine that are just snapshots I've taken out of the, uh, my windows of my house. Um, so evening grosbeaks have been visiting me, beautiful finch from the north and also pine siskins. And maybe some of you have seen these little striped birds with some yellow on them. And then I'm, I'm anticipating common red poles, which I'm really excited about. Really beautiful bird that's starting to be seen down here. So it's a really exciting year for this kind of bird. Um, but there's always the usual visitors to my feeder that I love. There's, you know, the chickadees and the juncos and, and the woodpeckers, downy and hairy and red-bellied woodpeckers. And um, yeah, lots of juncos. And uh, I'm telling you, like the birds right now are saving my life and my sanity. And I am obsessed with feeding them and making sure that they're well provided for. 
Well, it sounds like you have a bird filled yard. That's wonderful. Uh, we don't have those photos handy, Melissa, but I think we'll have more visuals later in the show. Jeff, oh, what are you seeing? Well, I'm in Western Massachusetts and actually much of the stuff that Melissa has uh, in her yard and around is what we're also getting around here. I'm also really excited about the evening grows beaks. Um, this is the first year in decades that there have been flocks of evening grows beaks moving down in the east. Uh, uh, and and there's, I, they're as far south now as Georgia and, and places like that. So it's really exciting. Um, honestly, what I love in my yard, almost to exclusion of other stuff, is black capped chickadees. Mm. They have so much in, and they're so engaging and they're so wonderful. And they tell you when the feeders are empty. Yeah. Um, and they <laughs> scold you if you don't feed them, you know, fill them up right away. So they're great birds. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, these are all really cool species. So I have a question for some of our viewers who may be putting out their feeders during the winter for the first time this year. Um, so I was wondering if either of you have starter tips that you'd recommend. And Melissa, we actually do have some photos of your feeders, so we can start with you. Fantastic. Um, am I able to see those photos so I can sort of explain to people what I've got? Yeah, so I actually just took this this morning with my iPhone out my window. We've had a bit of snow here the last couple of days, which is, is beautiful, if not completely welcome. A uh, little bit of a shock this morning. But um, as you can see, I've got a couple of these uh, long sort of tubular feeders, and, and those are great for all kinds of smaller songbirds. The main attraction is really on top of that pole on the left, I've got a platform feeder and a baffle there underneath it, which actually deters the squirrels from getting to it and from climbing up. And it's far enough away from any branches so squirrels can't leap onto the feeder. And then on the right side, and you can barely see this, but I have a kind of a, a, a Niger sock hanging to the right of that, that pole on the, on the right side. And goldfinches have been coming to that and, and I'm hoping pine siskins will. And then I have another tubular feeder and, and these tubular feeders are sort of squirrel proof. So squirrels try to get on them, but the openings shut down because uh, the weight of the, the creature actually um, makes sort of this, this door drop down. And so you're able to, to keep out squirrels from getting into your food too much. So this is my basic setup. I'm always running out. Oh, and there's also a suet feeder. Do you see there's a, a cage? You can't see it very well, but it's uh, to the right of the platform feeder right next to it. And so I'm always keeping the suet out there. And this was the morning I looked out a couple of weeks ago down from my bedroom window and I saw my platform feeder with these incredible evening gross beaks wow. on it. And that one in the middle that's really boldly colored is the male and the other three are the females. And evening grosbeaks really love these platform feeders. They're kind of chunky birds, quite large. I think they will come to hopper feeders, which is an enclosed kind of feeder, but they don't come to my tubular feeders. And that's the thing about feeding birds is you really have to learn that certain species come to certain kinds of feeders and you have to learn about the sorts of foods that you wanna to offer to attract different kinds. And black oil sunflower seed is, is pretty much the gold standard. Um, that's what most birds seem to like. Even the woodpeckers sometimes will choose seed before they choose suet. So um, the black oil sunflower seed. And uh, I think the best thing to do is sort of figure out what sorts of birds you really want to attract and then do a little bit of research to find out, okay, what's the best feeder that I need to have out there that's gonna bring that bird in. Because like cardinals that I'm crazy about, they won't come to those uh, cylindrical long feeders. They will only come to my platform feeder. And so um, it's just really important if you're, if you're trying to draw a particular bird in. Yeah, so like what kind of feeder. A really great setup. So I, I can see why you have so, so many bird guests coming to your, to your home. And yeah. um, I have a suet feeder actually myself. So those are some really good tips. I'll keep those in mind. And awesome. Jeff, what about you? Well, one of the things I like to make sure it sort of it shows in Melissa's photographs is, is to have a, a variety of different kinds of feeders so that you also are attracting in the different birds. It's good to have 
uh, we didn't talk about uh, Niger feed or, or thistle because that's what will really bring in the goldfinches and also the siskins. Um, siskins have tiny little bills, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from the evening grosbeaks, beaks. Um, and they, they just they gobble down the, the Niger and that's also what the red poles will come to. Um, the suet's important. Um, another thing that's actually quite important if you can do it in your yard is to have a, a heated bird bath. Um, it's a it's a real important thing for the birds to be able to to clean themselves year round. Um, obviously, if if you're in a cold environment and don't have and can't keep it warm, then you don't want to necessarily put it up a bird bath. But if you can have one that that's heated, that's a really uh, good thing. In terms of the placement, it's really um, it's 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 important to also keep uh, your feeders away from where uh, predators can also come and get them. Things like um, you know, neighborhood cats and stuff like that. Um, some people worry about, well, what about if a, a, a hawk comes in to, and grabs a bird at my feeder? And that's, you know, well, that's, that's why they call them bird feeders. Everybody has to eat. So um, it, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful way of getting a, a variety of birds into your yard and be able to actually get a really nice look at them. Well, thank you both for that. Um, please keep your questions coming. We're going to turn to some viewer questions in a moment and talk more about feeding birds. But uh, let's take a little bit of a detour for a minute. Melissa, in addition to the, the credits that we shared for you when we introduced you, uh, another thing in which you're an expert is the ethics of wildlife photography. And so I have a, a little bit of a counterintuitive question here, which is whether it's ever not okay to feed birds. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there. Um, people are always kind of wondering, uh, when is it okay? When is it appropriate? Can it be harmful? When is it harmful? And um, a lot of people kind of want to paint a situation with a broad brush, but every situation is, is very different. And so I sort of came up with a few basic questions that I think we can apply to any situation um, that I think will really help guide our decisions um, in a way that's that's best for the bird. And first off, is the species at risk? I think any time when we're dealing with a really vulnerable species, an endangered species, a threatened species, we have to think very carefully about what we're offering that bird. Um, for instance, Florida scrub jays, people typically used to feed them, them peanuts and now they're finding that that actually is, is really sort of harmful uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and that bird is really highly threatened. Um, but with songbirds at our feeders, that's not really a question we have to worry about so much. What we do really need to think about is, is the food appropriate and safely provided? And so when I say safely provided, you know, there's basic guidelines that if we follow them having to do with bird feeders, then bird feeders can actually enhance the survival of birds through winter. And, but there's some basic things we have to do. And one of them is um, to, to put our feeders at a certain distance from windows because window strikes kill a lot of birds. And I th think the current thinking is either within three feet of the window or, or farther than 30 feet from the window. And apparently that that's through a bunch of studies has shown that those are the safest uh, places to put the feeder. And then um, also safely providing food means uh, keeping the feeder clean and also keeping your cat indoors. Um, and we also have to think about our neighbors, you know, if our neighbors have an outdoor cat that's coming around and sees our bird feeder as a buffet to capture birds, then, you know, we need to talk to our neighbor or we need to just not feed the birds. Um, and also is the food appropriate? So really thinking through what is the best quality food I can offer my birds, make sure it's not moldy, make sure it's got like high fat and protein content. So as I said, black oil sunflower seeds or Niger seed is, is great. Um, bread is not great for any birds. You know, it's really, and if it becomes sort of the main staple of a bird's diet, it can be really detrimental to the bird. Um, so really thinking through those, those questions and following sort of best practices uh, for feeders is gonna be, you know, very helpful for our birds. And then the last question is, 
is feeding this bird likely to change its behavior in harmful ways? Well, we know that songbirds coming to feeders, we know that they're just kind of foraging, you know, visiting feeders is just one part of how they get food. Um, but so we're not really changing their behavior in harmful ways. And, but if you think about like people feeding gulls at the beach and how aggressive gulls get once they're fed and how they approach people really aggressively, you know, I think that's, that's a disservice to birds. Um, or for instance, some people will offer mice to owls and that can be, that, that's a really bad idea. There's a, a whole host of risks that that introduces to the owl and, and owls will change their behavior very readily. They really habituate very quickly to people when they come to expect food um, from humans. So, so really thinking through is feeding this bird um, gonna change behavior? And so I think these three questions, if we sort of think through them um, can help provide a little bit of guidance because as I said, you know, every situation is, is very different and um, we just have to bring some common sense to bear. I hope that's helpful and it's not too uh, complicated. No, I think yeah, this very is helpful. very helpful and, and very relevant. And we actually have a, a video turning that article with the three tips um, and showing, you know, some of, some of those things to keep in mind when you're, when you're putting out bird feeders. And um, we have a viewer, Regina, who says, you mentioned cleaning feeders. Do we just rinse them out? Um, well, with cleaning feeders, you really, they can really spread uh, disease quickly. Um, they can grow mold or introduce bacteria or, or viruses to a community of birds that can spread quite quickly. So it's super important, as I said, to keep your feeder clean. And what you can do is use, you can just use like hot water and some unscented dish soap and do a bit of scrubbing. Uh, some people like to use something stronger. They'll use like nine parts water to one part bleach. And that can be a really effective cleaning solution for feeders. Bird baths are important to keep clean too, certainly. Um, you want to just, you know, dump any contaminated water. And, and one good solution is to mix uh, nine parts water with one part vinegar. And you don't really want, definitely don't want to use chemicals in a, in a bird bath. So um, definitely keeping our feeders and bird baths clean is, is super important for keeping our birds healthy. Yeah, very much so. Thanks for those tips. And we have some articles and videos like the one you just saw about cleaning feeders. We'll drop that in the comments for folks who want to click through and see more on that. Thank you, Melissa. Um, sure. Jeff, we have another question from a viewer named Noel, who is curious how birds find feeders to begin with. Um, when you first put feeders out in your yard, sometimes it will take birds a while to find them if you've just moved to an area or are just starting to, to put feeders out for the birds. Um, once, as, as Melissa mentioned, the, the, the bird feeders are really just one stop on the, the sort of foraging route that most, most birds have in your yard or in, in your neighborhood. Um, so they're, they're constantly moving around. They have an amazing ability to remember where food resources are and different resources at different seasons or, or, or times. Um, so it may take them a little while to find the feeders, but once they do find them, and once a few birds find them, a lot more birds will start coming in. Um, so that's, it, it's, it, initially it takes a little bit of patience. It might take a week or so uh, mm -hmm. before the birds find it, but once they are there, then you you know, you know, they'll keep you busy. Exactly. One thing I also wanted to mention, uh, there were some pictures in there of hummingbird uh, feeders. And for the folks out west and, and down further south, uh, it is important to keep you know, the hummingbird feeders out during, during year, year round. Um, in the colder climates, you obviously don't need to, but, um, but it's, it's a good thing and, a, and a, an important thing also to keep the hummingbird feeders clean. Yeah, excellent point. Um, well, Jeff, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you're the director of the Audubon CBC, which is one of the longest running community science projects in the world, and uh, certainly uh, one of the, certainly the longest wildlife census in the United States. 
Um, but this 121st year for the Audubon CBC is going to look pretty different than almost any other year in its history. Um, so I'm wondering what flex reflections you have about that and whether feeders and backyards might have a role to play. Feeders and backyards are going to have a very an even more important role to play than usual in the Christmas bird count. Uh, feeder watching is, is, has always been an important aspect of the data that we gather for the CBC. Um, it's a stationary method, so it's a slightly different methodology from the people that are out wandering around counting birds everywhere they go. But um, this year, with in the in our attempts to be running a COVID safe Christmas count, where really we have to be, you know, no no social gatherings, all social distancing. Um, I think the feeder watching is probably going to be an even more uh, important component this this season. Um, it's it's. It, like I said, it's a little bit different methodology in terms of the CBC where you don't just keep counting chickadees as they're coming in. You actually, actually what you do is you count the maximum number that you see or hear at any given time. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also, as we you know, are un, less able to get out and about and definitely can't travel as much in the current climate, um, I think exploring our own patches, whether it's just our yard or our local neighborhoods has, has been a real boon to birders and keeps many of us sane. Um, so yeah, the, the, this year, I think the, the feeder component of the Christmas bird count is gonna be uh, more important than ever. Yeah, and, and I think it's really cool that we can still carry on these um, bird counts through, you know, in our own little ways from our own homes. So. Thank you, Melissa and Jeff, so much for sharing your knowledge for this segment. Um, I don't think we've seen so many comments from our viewers before, so thank you all and keep those questions and comments coming. I definitely have seen a lot of people saying they've learned a lot from you both, and I am also happy to say that as well. So thank you both. Thanks so much. Thanks very thank much. You. Bye, everybody. Bye. Well, now we're moving on from uh, bird feeders to other ways that you can create habitat for birds around your home, uh, including one of my personal favorite topics, as you might be able to see around me, native plants. Um, so here with us this evening to talk about ways that you can do all of that uh, is John Roden, who's Audubon Senior Director for Bird Friendly Communities, and Connie Sanchez, who's a Program Manager for Bird Friendly Buildings with Audubon. Welcome to you both. Thank you for being here. Thanks, David. Thank you. Hello. So we're going to start with a question for you, John, which I know you love to answer. Why exactly are native plants good for birds? Thanks, Christine. And hey, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, I'm joining from Los Angeles, so it's still daytime out here and quite lovely. Um, there are some planes circling overhead, so if you have trouble hearing me, just let me know. Um, Native plants, one of my favorite topics, of course. Um, so, and it's great to follow up on that, um, on the topic of food for birds, because in bird-friendly communities at Audubon, what we're looking to provide are food, shelter, safe passage, and places to raise young for the birds we share our communities with. And native plants are fantastic for that. Plants provide resources directly, either through food, nectar, berries, nuts, etc or indirectly by, um, based on the insects that they host. And that's particularly important during breeding because the vast, vast majority of our terrestrial bird species feed insects to their young, principally caterpillars. So our native plants, because they've evolved with our native insect species, and there's a tight relationship there, are much better hosts for our native insects that are that incredibly important food for baby birds. And so as we're thinking about holistically across the year, what we can actually provide for birds that we share our spaces with is planting native plants actually provides great habitat across the year for um, our native bird species. That's it in a nutshell. Thanks, John. And yes, uh, this is a cerulean warbler that we were just seeing. I see one of our viewers named Helen got that right. Great job. Um, well, uh, you know, of course, we're heading into, in many parts of the country, a much colder time of year, not everywhere, John. Um, but when we talk about native plants, you know, it's easy to think about the spring uh, or even summer, but fall is a really important season for native plants as well. And Connie, I'd love to hear some thoughts from you on that. Sure, David, right. So often people just think about spring planting season, but really fall is a great time to get trees and shrubs in the ground in many parts of the country. 
Um, we've got cooler temperatures and wet weather in the fall that provides a better start for the plants. So the plants can take advantage of the relatively warm soil temperatures to establish root systems, even as the air temperatures are getting colder. And when spring arrives, the plants will have established these root systems and be ready to grow when the sun hits them. So um, now here in the east, it might be a little late in the season though, but um, in some parts of the country, actually in California where John is, it's the ideal time to plant everything, you know, with late fall, you know, early winter right now um, in advance of the rains and that will really help the plants get established. So, and their spring planting actually is an ideal, so. Yeah, it's good to know that there's still some planting to look forward to in the fall. So, John, you are in lovely California. Um, I believe we have the pleasure of seeing some of the native native plants that you have in your own yard. Sure, I'm happy to show you um, some of the stuff we have here. And I, I should note that for folks that are interested in what plants are native to their area, they can visit audubon.org, our native plants database. And just by entering their zip code, they can actually find out what plants are native to their local area. But here in Venice Beach, where I live, we have a few really awesome plants that I wanted to share with you. Um, one that we have right here is, this is a Dudleya, which, oh wait, there's my dog Zip over there. Hey, Zipper. <laughs> um, I did not preposition her. Um, this is a, a, a great succulent that we have here that's native to this area, and you can see that it is starting to flower. We are getting a little bit, we've started to get into a little bit of rain, and this is a great plant. Um, hummingbirds actually take advantage of those flowers, and so we hope to be seeing some of those soon. Um, right over here next to me, this is a plant called the Cleveland Sage, and this is, as the name would imply, is a sage. It's a great, it's in the salvia genus. And you can see here we are in November and a lot of the California natives have actually, aren't looking super great, right? We still do have some of these flowers on this plant, but what's really important that you can see here are all these seed heads, if you can see that. And what that is, those are the, the um, we, we leave those on the plants in the winter because those provide great forage for birds. There's little tiny seeds in there that they'll take advantage of and I still, when the flowers are blooming, we see a lot of hummingbirds come by, but I see things like, actually I've seen some black Phoebes in the yard just, just while we've been talking in here that are snapping up insects. Um, bush tits come through and, and fossick around in these. And so one thing that I, I want at one point I wanna make is that people should think about um, leaving those seed heads on the plants um, over the winter because they does provide really good food for, for our birds. And one thing that I, one point, and I think we're gonna make this a little bit is, is we're giving, going to, um, as we talk about yard maintenance and how you can help birds with maintaining your yard, laziness is something to embrace, right? Okay, I think that 2020 has been a rough year. We all need a little bit of time, you know, to relax and unwind. So don't spend time on your yard maintenance and um, including not deadheading your plants, I think is a great thing. The birds will thank you. A great quote to go by. So John, we actually have a lot of viewers asking what plants they should plant in their yards. So we want to pull up the native plants database that you mentioned earlier um, and show you live and just walk you through that. So we're going to put in a random zip code 45202 and let's see what list this will come up with. All right, well here we are in Ohio. Ohio. Um, I'll just very quickly walk through this, Christine, if, if you want. So um, what is up, up at top is a really important aspect of this, which is what your local Audubon is. If you have a local Audubon that can help you with this, we have the plants um, organized in different tabs. So the best results tabs show the plants that are um, best for your local area are generally commercially available, will support birds and the the list to the right is what birds they'll attract. There's a little bit of information there and you can filter based on if you're interested in attracting particular types of birds or if you are um, interested particularly in grasses or perennials, whatever you, you, your interest may be, you can uh, use those filters for that functionality. And then there's a tab farther over, which actually is the local resources tab, which will again point you to local Audubons that can give you, provide you support plus other um, resources, including retailers where you can actually purchase native plants, because I know that that actually can be a barrier for people if they can't actually find the native plants. 
So that's a very quick um, overview of how we've organized the, the database. And I 100% encourage people to dig into that and, and it will give you a wealth of information about native plants in your area. Yeah, it's a tremendous resource. And there at the end, you're seeing, we also list local Audubon chapters, nurseries, native plant societies, garden clubs can all be on that resource page near you. So a great wealth of information. And John, kudos to you and your team for making all that available to everyone. Um, so John, let me go back to something else you said a minute ago, which is that laziness is for the birds. Uh, so let's talk about a couple of other ways that we can uh, make more habitat for birds in ways that also maybe ease our burdens of lawn care? So one thing is brush piles, right? So um, when we think about creating that habitat at home in our yards, um, brush piles are something to think about. So these offer a place for birds to hide and forage in. So think about a corner of your property to offer you know, these birds shelter in extreme weather. Um, and during this fall cleanup, as you think about this time, set aside some of the down branches or these tree trunks that you find if they're available. And you know, just use that as a foundation and then just heap fallen or cut branches and layers and these will really serve as a place um, to provide shelter for these birds. So that's one way. And John, you've got another way, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna talk about raking and, and somebody made a comment earlier that here in California, we don't necessarily do as much raking, but there definitely are leaves that fall off our trees. And, and uh, again, we want to give you permission to not do um, to not do raking. Leave those leaves on the ground, or if you if you want to, put them maybe under your plants. And there's a few things there, right? So one is that as those leaves decompose, they'll provide nutrients for the soil and will help your plants grow more effectively. But one other interesting thing is that um, the vast majority actually of moth larvae. So butterfly, um, butterflies and moths lay their eggs on our native plants, as I already mentioned. And a lot of the butterflies um, larvae then transform into adults um, holding onto the plants. But a lot of moth pupae actually fall off the plants into the leaf litter and continue their life cycle there. And so if you wanna actually promote the, the continued existence of moths, there you go. Just leave, a, leave your leaves be and let those larvae develop and we'll all be better for it. So there's some, some lazy um, time-saving tips for you that can help birds as well. Love it. Yeah, some great tips from you both. Uh, we have a good question from a viewer named Kathy. Do native plants provide higher levels of nutrition than non-native plants? I'll take that one. I mean, that is a great question. There's actually some um, really interesting research just to that point that actually native plants and the, and the berries they produce actually do provide um, a more complete set of nutrition for our native bird species. And so that is one other thing about the direct resources that our native plants um, provide. And that again is part of a coevolutionary process that we can understand why that's beneficial for it, but it is, it is another benefit of our native plants. Just another reason why native plants are great. There's so many reasons. So many. So we've talked a little bit about um, making the space around our home more welcoming for birds. And now I wanna pivot and ask a question that we see often, which is how can we prevent birds from flying into our windows? And Connie, we can start with you. Right, that's a great question, Christine. And you know, some of the key things to think about in terms of preventing birds from flying into windows is really light and glass is what we're looking at. So we often think about this problem of collisions during migration at night, but in actuality, it's a year round problem which occurs during the day as well as nighttime. So um, more often than we realize. Um, when we're talking about at nighttime, lights contribute to these collisions as they confuse and disorient birds or even attract birds in some cases. And we often hear about this with birds migrating at night in cities with skyscrapers, but lighting actually does have negative impacts in all areas. So in suburbs and rural areas as well. So consider your home lighting um, as it really does um, impact not just birds, but also other wildlife. So we've got this great graphic up here, um, thanks to our partners at the International Dark Sky Association, IDA. Um, so these are some things to think about, you know, in terms of your lighting, does it have a clear purpose um, or is it directed to only where it's needed? Is it brighter than necessary? Um, do you have a motion sensor on it or a timer? Um, and color is also very important. So 
that's what we've got up here. So some things to think about as you take a look at um, what you've got at home in terms of your lighting. And switching gears as we think about glass, uh, reflectivity and transparency of the windows is what really creates that hazard for birds. Birds don't see glass and often try to fly into their the reflections of the sky or surrounding habitat. Um, or sometimes they're flying through into an indoor plant that you've got right inside of the window. Um, so as you think about your own home windows, um, the key is really to create some visual cues for birds to see the glass. Um, and there's a number of ways that we can do that. Um, John will be demonstrating that in just a moment. Um, and so there are some products that you can buy as well as do-it-yourself solutions. So I'm gonna have John take it away because he's ready to do his demo. Fairly I am, I switched locations. So I'm out here um, looking at the outside of our house. And um, as Connie mentioned, in, there's, there's many ways that you can actually make your windows more um, visible to birds. And there's, um, there's things you might have around the house. You can use tempura paint and actually just paint on the outside. Uh, you can use um, different types of, of tape. Uh, what, the, the critical thing is that it, uh, the, the solutions are on the outside of the glass so that it breaks up the pattern. And you can see if we tilt this up a little bit, how reflective that window up on top is, right? That you, you would think that that's habitat. And I've already treated most of this window below that. Um, but that's what you have to break uh, up that pattern. You can also put screens over the window and actually, but we typically have a screen on this window. I took it down so that we could try this solution out for you. Um, what I'm gonna show you is a, is a commercial solution that's called Feather Friendly, which is a tape that has actual, if you can see it, it has um, small dots on it, which form a pattern once you put it on the window. And this is just one of the products that, have, that is available. We think it's a great product, but again, you can use solutions that you might find around the house uh, to do this. So um, we generally talk about what's called the four by two rule or the two by four rule, which is that the spacing of any apparent object should be um, no more than two inches in height and four inches in diameter. And that's because research shows that birds will fly through those spaces. Um, there's there's also um, emphasis on perhaps two by two, particularly um, if you're talking about hummingbirds, obviously as much smaller birds, they may go for smaller spaces. And the feather friendly is actually set up to be a two by two um, matrix, which is, is great and will be super effective. So what you can see is that I've already put this mostly on the window. I'm gonna put the very last one on for you so you can see how it works. Um, the, the, again, these are spaced at two inches. And so if I just put this like this, um, and go across here. It's a really simple product to apply. And what that does then, so I hope you could hear that when I have my back turned, but as you can see, it actually then just creates this very apparent pattern to the birds. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, obstruct the view from the inside as you're looking out the window, but it just makes the, the window so much more apparent to birds and will prevent collisions. So that's one of the great solutions if you're attracting birds to your yard and you really do want to make your house uh, or whatever space you're in uh, better for them. Well, it's looking really good there, John. I'm sure the birds will appreciate it. Uh, David? We'll make sure folks have, <laughs> you're welcome. We'll make sure folks have a link to learn more. Um, and to close this segment out, we have a great question from our viewer, Franya. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, which is, uh, and John, maybe this for you, are cultivars and hybrids of native plants as nutritious and attractive to birds as the, the species? Yeah, so we generally recommend that people uh, tr avoid cultivars if possible. Um, they, because cultivars, so what cultivars are is they've been bred from the native plant stock for specific um, features, whether it be flower color or other things, time of flowering. And what, what happens is that during that um, selective breeding process, they actually are altered, those plants. And so they don't necessarily do as good a job as insect hosts, those sorts of things. And so we don't, if, if cultivars are all that are available, they're better than non-native plants, but the optimal choice is um, native plants and not cultivars. Thanks.
Well, thank you both Connie and John for sharing your super helpful tips that our viewers can quite literally take home with them and um, implement to make their spaces better for birds. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to continue our theme of ways that you can help birds uh, and enjoy and protect them from home. So we're going to turn our attention to America's most important bird protection law. And this law was passed in 1918 with the support of early Audubon advocates and other conservationists. It's called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, we abbreviate it as MBTA. Um, that law protects nearly all of our country's native birds and is credited with saving numerous species from extinction over the years, including the snowy egret, the wood duck, and the sandhill crane. Uh, so to talk about this bedrock conservation law, uh, current threats against it, and ways that you can help, we're welcoming to the program David Mears, who's Executive Director for Audubon in Vermont and a former law professor and environmental engineer, and Eric Schneider, who's a public policy expert and is a policy analyst for the National Audubon Society uh, working on issues in Washington, DC. So welcome to you both. Thanks for having me. Thanks. You're welcome. So Eric, let's start with you and jump right in to explain what the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is. Great, well, thanks, David. Well, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is one of the biggest reasons uh, we get to see and enjoy birds um, around our communities and around the country. Um, as David said, it protects nearly every single native bird um, in our country, including all the species we've been talking about today. So if there's one thing to take away today, uh, know that if you're helping to protect the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, you can help protect almost every bird in America all at once. Um, so chances are your favorite bird is protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, whether it's an owl or a hawk, a rare warbler, an albatross, eagle, hummingbird, or pelican, it, they're all protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Unless your favorite bird is a house sparrow, and then unfortunately you're out of luck because introduced species are not protected uh, by the MBTA. So without this law, there's a good chance that none of us would be able to see the egrets and herons um, like we see in this picture. Um, at our local ponds and wetlands, turns at the beach, and many, many of the songbirds in our backyards and parks. Um, so in the late 19th century, there were essentially no environmental laws. Uh, millions of birds uh, were sadly um, being, killed, being killed without any regulations, and that left some species um, going extinct, like the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet. And many more species were on the brink. So at that time, the biggest threat was on unregulated hunting, um, including for, for markets and for, for even fashion, including some of the plumes you see in, in this picture. Um, so the first Audubon societies formed in order to gain protections for birds. Um, and that included leadership by two amazing women who founded the Massachusetts Audubon Society in 1896. And their incredible work led to the passage of new state and federal laws um, and eventually the signing of, of a treaty with Canada to protect migratory birds, and that's where the name comes from. Um, so the Migratory Bird Treaty Act helps carry out that treaty, um, treaties with three other nations, and it finally assured that we have protections for birds in our country. Yeah, and something I find inspiring about the history of Audubon is that it's essentially grounded in um, a collective of women coming together and doing the work that ultimately led to the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So um, Eric, I'm now wondering if you could talk a little bit about why a strong MBTA is so important a century after this passage. Well, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, essentially what it does is it prohibits anyone from killing, possessing, or selling most species of our native birds, as well as uh, nests and eggs without a permit. And so as noted, this helped stop a lot of the unregulated hunting um, that was going on and saved species like the snowy egret and sandhill crane from extinction. Um, it's why you need a license to go hunting now um, and why you, um, you can't remove nests and eggs from, you know, from our forests. Uh, but it's also why companies have had a responsibility to make sure that their actions aren't unnecessarily harming birds from their activities. Um, so unfortunately, every year, millions and millions of birds um, are killed in preventable ways, uh, including by industrial activities that while they didn't necessarily intend to, nonetheless can be avoided. Um, and so when it comes to things like we see here, oil, oil waste pits. So these are uh, ponds uh, from oil extraction activities 
um, that are you know, mixed with oil and water and those drown a lot of birds and hundreds of thousands of birds sadly every year. Uh, power lines and, and gas flares as well as oil spills. Um, you know, power lines, fortunately many birds uh, will, will collide with the, the lines or they can be electrocuted as well. And so the Migratory Bird Treaty Act has been our most important tool for helping us minimize those impacts to birds and make sure that companies are taking simple precautions to help save birds. Um, they also help provide resources for recovery um, uh, through fines after birds are impacted by things like oil spills. Um, and so that's especially important when we had the Deepwater Horizon spill in, in the Gulf, uh, which led to a hundred million dollar fine under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act um, uh, after the death of an estimated one million birds. So that goes right into restoring habitat for birds that were impacted by the spill. And that's personal for me, Eric, as you and some of our viewers know, I was working for Audubon on the Gulf Coast when the BP oil spill started. Um, and that, here are some pictures that I took at the time during that experience. So this is one of the healthy, productive wetlands in Louisiana that's full of nesting brown pelicans, laughing gulls, lots of other species. And sadly, I saw scenes like this transformed into scenes like in the next couple of pictures here, uh, where we had healthy birds completely covered in oil, uh, barely able to float. Um, they, can, they cannot float or swim very well when they're covered with oil. They can't regulate their body temperatures well. This is a laughing gull that's completely covered by oil uh, and was taken to a rescue. Um, this is a breeding island with roseate spoonbills, great egrets, brown pelicans, uh, white ibises. Uh, and you can see those three kind of brownish birds in the middle of the picture there. Those are three baby roseate spoonbills um, that were born during the oil spill and became completely covered with oil. Um, and so the, the, the law that Eric is articulating there um, means that this kind of thing, even when it's an accident, isn't acceptable. There have to be things in place to stop accidents as much as possible before they happen. And then when they do happen, as Eric said, we need funds to create restoration activities uh, so that these terrible, terrible injuries to our birds and our ecosystems uh, can be repaired. Yeah, those are some really powerful images, David, David Ringer. <laughs> and um, Eric, I know there's been some rollbacks recently in the past few years for the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what those were and what that means for birds. Sure. So, so first off, to start, you know, the science and, and birds are telling us that, that our, our migratory bird species are in trouble. We saw a report last year which found that since 1970, um, North America has lost about 3 billion birds on our, on our continent. Um, that's about a 30% decline in, in, in all of our birds um, in North America. And Audubon put out a, a really important climate report, uh, which found that um, about two thirds of our, of our North American bird species are, are threatened uh, by climate change. So we know that we need to be doing far more to protect birds um, and, and not less. But unfortunately in 2017, um, the, the administration uh, eliminated protections for birds under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which have been in place for, for numerous decades. Um, and so what happened is that uh, essentially let industries and companies off the hook from needing to protect birds um, and, and really just provided a, a free pass uh, for, for harm to birds for the first time. And for decades, there's been bipartisan support for uh, keeping birds protected uh, from all sources of harm, you know, not just uh, things like hunting and poaching of birds, but, but also things like oil spills. Um, and companies should take precautions and, and use practices that are available to help protect birds, whether it's covering up an oil pit or marking a power line so that you know, birds can see it when they're, they're migrating. That's really, really important to help uh, make sure we're turning around our bird populations. And so um, what happened is, is the administration said, uh, you can't be responsible for harm to birds under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act if you didn't mean to cause the harm. Well, the truth is no one means to cause an oil spill, but we need to make sure that, you know, there is some responsibility there and we're, we're able to um, provide funding for recovery and, and help minimize that before it happens. And so um, in, in December uh, 2017, just a few days before Christmas, um, they put out this, this new policy, a new interpretation of the law. Um, 
it was it was not a nice Christmas present that year uh, for us, um, and it's 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 been a, a big effort for us to to really push back and make sure that we we can still have uh, these really important um, incentives to make sure we're helping to protect birds. Yeah, I mean, as someone who witnessed the oil spill firsthand in the Gulf of Mexico, the notion that there would have been no accountability for that on behalf of all the birds that died under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, it just makes my blood boil. Um, but you know, here we wanna make sure we underscore the cause for hope and the role that each of you and Audubon can play in turning some of this around. So David Mears, let's turn to you and talk about the role that uh, we as an organization and many of our viewers tonight have been playing. Well, thanks. Yeah, it, and it's, uh, it's kind of powerful what this organization can do when we put our minds to it. Uh, and the power really of the common uh, sense of, of uh, protection that we all feel for these vulnerable creatures. One of the things that Audubon did was uh, to file a lawsuit along with some other environmental groups in a number of states to challenge that uh, decision that the Department of Interior uh, made that Eric referenced earlier. And uh, the judge that reviewed that in the Southern District of New York, Federal Judge Caproni, uh, eviscerated that, that opinion, just found it was completely unsupported by the law. And uh, she, she opened her decision with this really wonderful quote that I'll read to you. Um, it's not, it's not only a sin to kill a mockingbird, it's also a crime, um, which kind of set the tone. You could see where she was going with the decision from there. Um, so that was a, a big success. Uh, and also, you know, but that's not the end of the road. As you could imagine, uh, now the, the federal government has now appealed that decision into the appeals court. So it still remains in, in uh, dispute. There's also rules that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, likely to propose any day now, um, even as it's likely that the, uh, the leadership of their agency will be heading out the door as there's a new administration coming into play. They've adopt, they're headed towards adopting a rule that would basically adopt the same reasoning of the flawed uh, opinion that was already overruled. But another way in which we have some hope is to support legislation. The U.S. House of Representatives has a bipartisan bill pending. Um, it's called HR 5552, and it's called the Migratory uh, Bird Protection Act. And it would uh, basically create, restore the protections that have been proposed to be lost by this new rule and would take that authority away from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to undermine this important bedrock law. Uh, it would create a new permitting program. Uh, it has, it's bipartisan and has about 95 sponsors. It's got a, a wide array of support. So we're hopeful that that will, but will move. And on the Senate side, there's a growing level of opposition to the federal rulemaking from the U.S. Senate. So all of those things combined provide an opportunity for Audubon members uh, and our organization to have our voices heard. Yeah, and I know um, both David Mears and Eric Schneider have examples of how states have stepped up recently. So um, David, why don't we start with you? Well, one of the things I, I'm really proud of was the way that the Audubon Vermont membership stepped up in this past year in Vermont. We passed a bill that's now called Act 172 that uh, basically restored at the state of Vermont level, the protections that were taken away or proposed to be taken away by the federal government. It's a simple bill. It just simply says, um, it responds to the point that Eric made that you, you need protections for activities, industrial activities that cause harm to birds, uh, even if that wasn't necessarily the intention of the act. And so this law simply restores that. It was passed nearly unanimously in our house and our Senate and in part, that's because of our membership. And I wanted to just share a little story that uh, we had so many members calling and testifying and contacting senators and representatives that uh, the, the Senate committee chair who leads the kind of key committee on the Senate side of Vermont's legislature approached me at one point and said, you can tell them to relax. Like <laughs> All of my colleagues are saying no more. <laughs> We've heard enough. We promised to vote for it. Um, so it's it's a reinforcement that the power that led to the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act at the beginning of the 20th century, that same power still resides in our in our uh, democratic process. The Audubon members can make an important difference. Yeah, well said. Uh, what about you, Eric? Yeah, we we also had wonderful leadership from from Audubon California, our California state office, which stepped up. And they also passed legislation. It was signed by the governor. And so that gives the opportunity for California as well 
to be able to protect birds and, and reinstate these, these really important protections. But you know, also want to mention that it's, it's really important that we do have these, these federal protections in place. And that's, that's really why we have the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in the first place, because no single state can protect a migratory bird species on its own, right? Um, so we have to have this collaborative um, national framework. Um, and that's what um, we're, we're hoping to get back. Exactly. And I think that's a um, good way to go into our final question, which is what does the future hold for the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and those of us who are looking to continue to protect it? Yeah, so as, as David Mears mentioned, we've had some, some great news lately. We've had a big win in the courts um, that's going to help us tremendously that, that overturn this, this policy, but it's not the end of the fight. So um, unfortunately, we are expecting um, the, the, the current administration to, to try to sidestep that and, and double down on this policy in the coming weeks with the, with the new regulation. Um, so the uh, fact is that though we are seeing you know, changes in, in the dynamics in Washington uh, starting in early next year. So um, you know, we will be encouraging the, the incoming administration to take swift action to, to help restore the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, and, and no matter the outcome in the courts or in the administration, we, we need Congress to step in and pass the Migratory Bird Protection Act uh, because we need to secure the MBTA and its protections for birds once and for all. Well, we've made some really good progress this year, um, but we need Congress to step up and take it up again in the next session and, and get it across the finish line. And I've been really hardened to see the hundreds of thousands of Americans who have uh, voiced their opposition to the rollback of the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act more than 75,000 Audubon advocates have engaged uh, to protect the MBTA. It's, it's really amazing. And it, it, it makes me think back to 1918 when thousands of Audubon members uh, were sending telegrams to their, to their members of Congress um, demanding that birds be protected. You know, so we're continuing this, this amazing tradition of, of the Audubon Society and our, our wonderful membership um, demanding that, that birds are protected. And, um, We've seen some, some other great um, activities like um, in more than 60 cities, counties, and states passed proclamations in 2018, which we call the Year of the Bird, the, the 100 year anniversary of the MBTA. So I'm, I'm really hopeful about the future of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the future of our birds. Um, they're of course very connected, um, but it's not gonna happen on its own. It will uh, only happen if uh, you know folks uh, like you're watching get engaged and, and help make it happen. And, you know, with so many crises happening around us, I know there's, there's a lot of big things to be worrying about uh, right now. Um, but, you know, I think in hard times, simple things like being able to enjoy the, the sight of a song sparrow or seeing a flock of sandhill cranes overhead really helps us get through these, these tough times, right? And it helps us give us some, a little bit of joy and levity. I, I know it does, at least for me. And so defending the MBTA, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, I think it's one of the best ways we can continue to have those experiences and enjoy birds now and, and for the next generations. Yeah, thank you for that, Eric. And I can definitely speak for myself that birds have brought me joy throughout this year as well. Um, and while you're both here, we, are, we wanna close each episode um, as we always do with one thing that you can do for birds. And because we just learned about the history and importance of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, this seems like a good point to share how viewers can take direct action. So I'm really inspired personally to hear Eric say that more than 75,000 advocates have already taken action with Audubon to voice their support for the bipartisan MBTA, MBPA, sorry, um, which is in, this is a permanent legislative fix to these rollbacks that are so harmful for birds. And I'm also one of these advocates who took the action. It's really easy to do. And I have to say, it feels really powerful to be part of this whole movement to protect the birds that we all know and love. So we're going to walk you through how to do that right now. And I'm inviting you all to join me and our fellow bird lovers across the country to doing this. And we have this action alert set up. Um, as you can see here, where you can fill out a few pieces of key information and be connected to your member of Congress, depending on where you live. And as I said, it's really easy um, and it's a really quick way to, to make your voice heard and to speak up for the birds. And Audubon will then deliver your comments to new members in January to be sure that they know the MBTA is a priority for the 117th United States Congress. So you can take action 
at www.audubon.org slash MBTA. Um, so without further ado, thank you to David Mears, to Eric Schneider, to David Ringer. Oh, I love your mask, by the way. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you for joining us and to our viewers, of course, for tuning in tonight. And we'll see you all next month for our special year in review show. See you soon, everyone. Bye-bye.